So for years, I have been uh, working on the idea of the, the, of the kitchenless house, as many of you might know, because there's something provocative of, uh, and at the same time kind of uh, revealing of this act of uh, eliminating the kitchen from the house. The actual generalized uh, social refusal that this action often provokes allows us to understand the deep affections and assumptions that this domestic space arises. The kitchen has been uh, one of the pieces that culturally has constituted the core of what uh, Western culture understands by domesticity. Ideologically speaking, it has had a main role in the capitalist definition of the idea of home. What's going on? Sorry. Um, so as I was saying, the ideologically speaking, it has had the main role in the definition in the capitalist definition of the idea of home, as well as I, as the ideological construction of the notion of family, and subsequently in the creation of uh, gender biases relations within the domestic sphere. This. Um, Space gender relationship has changed and evolved alongside the evolution of this uh, social economic system, and it can be traced back to the to its origins, to the origins of uh, capitalism. The transition from uh, feudalism to capitalism, and I'm referring here to uh, approximately the time span that goes from around the 15th century to the 18th century, was characterized by the so-called primitive accumulation, as Karl Marx um, defined it, which was based on the progressive concentration of land along uh, with the appropriation and the formation of the idea of the independent worker a worker independent from the land uh, who no longer pays the tax for working, uh, but uh, think about the tithes, but becomes a wage earner. This, uh, with this apparition of the wage, the image of the man as productive uh, force was built. As uh, Silvia Federici um, indicates in her book uh, uh, titled Caliban and the Witch, this proto-capitalist uh, process required the transformation of the body into a work machine and the submission of uh, women uh, for the production of the workforce. In that sense, primitive accumulation required not only the accumulation of goods, but also the accumulation of differences and divisions within, uh, within the work working class in, uh, in which uh, hierarchies uh, built on gender, age and race became, became constitutive of the formation of the modern proletariat, the one that we know of today. The idea of home was gradually built uh, in the image and likeness of uh, these uh, uh, structural changes, progressively dividing and separating productive workspaces, which uh, occupied, was, were occupied by men, from uh, residential uh, places of free production work occupied by women. This process of uh, gender-based uh, relational classification was reinforced with the first uh, industrial revolution, especially during the 18th uh, uh, century and first half of the 19th century. And at that moment, what we can perceive is how homes were radically stripped and liberated of uh, workplaces, shops, and other similar spaces of economic production. And uh, they were redefined as uh, places of care. Um, and here, recalling the terminology of uh, Federici again, uh, places of labor of love, which is basically work undertaken uh, by women in the um, domestic sphere with no economical retribution that supports the other work, the uh, productive labor. In that sense, uh, we can see how this transformation, uh, suddenly the house uh, became uh, detached from direct uh, economical production and at the same time became an extension of the female body. From there, the following industrial changes and technological revolutions, the second, the third, and the actual uh, fourth revolution had had an effect on this uh, space uh, gender relation. 
redefining and reinforcing um, this heteropatriarchal relation and influencing consequently the way the house has been designed and perceived. If during the first uh, industrial revolution, uh, the space of reproduction was progressively secluded from the space of uh, production. Uh, during the second industrial revolution, which happened from the late 19th century to the 20th century, the emerge of new forms of um, energy, um, electricity, among others, boosted uh, the signification of the house, which became the space of efficiency housekeeping. In that sense, the redefinition of the kitchen and consequently of the home uh, shows how the notion of efficiency was introduced to the domestic sphere. Taylorism and other productive uh, methods related with efficiency and mass production were implemented into the home. And it coincides, as we will see later on, uh, with the emerge of uh, the so-called domestic engineering. In other words, after productive labor remains detached from the domestic sphere, its ideology, efficiency and so on, um, is progressively introduced within the home. It is precisely at that moment, at the beginning of the 20th century, when uh, reproductive labor started to be presented all of a sudden, um, not as a bargain, uh, but as an effortless activity especially thanks to this operation of uh, new domestic appliances that uh, brought the promise of the elimination of uh, domestic labor. Of course, um, uh, this was totally unfulfilled and uh, this unfulfilled promise has to be understood in a moment of uh, gradual inc introduction and incorporation of women as a labor force. This uh, new almost uh, ma magic and um, almighty devices define uh, the modern house and were supposed to solve the progressive inclusion of women into, into this productive uh, labor. From then onwards, uh, women uh, were um, allegedly able, and uh, I'm saying this uh, between uh, question marks, um, to do, the women was able to do both uh, labors at the same time, productive and reproductive perpetuating in that way and assuring this, uh, the original heteropatriarchal uh, system of power, despite contradicting precisely its initial gender uh, space labor division. With this promise, productive and reproductive uh, labor has started to converge under highly biased asymmetrical um, gender asymmetry. I don't want to stand myself too much on this, but um, something similar actually happened, uh, technologically speaking, happened um, during the third industrial revolution. In that case, related with the appearance of media and, uh, and, um, and their centrality in the house. Think of the TV, for instance, as the main domestic object uh, of this new capital power. If you want to read further, I highly recommend uh, Pornotopia by Paul de Preciado, uh, the, um, the book titled Pornotopia, where alongside media, Preciado points out to which extent the pharmacopornographic uh, control of the body and its sexuality started to, to trouble the traditional relationship between gender, sexuality, uh, power, and domestic space. Obviously, obviously race is still not they are dead, as you can see in this image. Of course, uh, all these changes that I'm presenting today are never progressive, neither evolutive, neither linear. History is more closer to a roller coaster with a lot of tracks and a lot of uh, disruptions, uh, not uh, that uh, close to a clean climb. And despite general tendencies, there are always exceptions and resistances. It is precisely during these moments of industrial change, every time that we change uh, one uh, industrial cycle to another, when most counter narratives uh, emerge. Projects and proposals that try to re envision and reshape this capitalist uh, space uh, gender bias relationship and other forms of exclusion. However, capital has uh, permanently been able to engulf this sand, which ends up uh, being swallowed by the very system it fights against. 
the system has the ability to see value in resistant architectures and often then as well as, as engulf them. Today, I will present how this happened in New York during the second industrial revolution, and it's parallelized uh, with the actual fourth revolution, the revolution that we're living in, boosted by the emerge of internet. The following lecture is uh, focused on women, but these uh, processes of capital colonialism uh, have affected the management and production of the body at large. As Foucault told us, it's really important here, um, there is uh, no politics that is uh, not a politics of bodies. Bodies with race, uh, with gender, sexuality, and age that have uh, been part of the construction of actual structures of power. So this narration, uh, today's narration, does not deny other colonial processes. This is just one of them, and it's really important to remember that. A few days ago, Paul de Preciado, whom I just mentioned before, published in an, an article in El País, I totally recommend reading it, describing how its society can be defined by the epidemic that uh, threatens it, and by the way of organizing in front of it, organizing the society in front of it. So we could compare this, uh, a similar question can be extended to our discussion today. Each society can be defined by how production, labor is understood, and the way of organizing it. Uh, in these days, uh, during which a space of care and heal are more needed, visible, and unveiled in a daily manner through the internet, it is a good time to once again, once again, again question the state of historical, this, the state of this historical conflict between productive and reproductive labor and its related architectures and economies in the actual digital and mutating scene. The simple exercise to describe reproductive labor and its bodies and architectures unveils a lot from a particular society. Maybe uh, it would be good to, to do, or the first step could be to eliminate the old labor dichotomy between productive and reproductive. So the content of this lecture uh, will be published soon in a book, so stay tuned, please. And it's actually a result of eight years of research that ended up being a PhD uh, that I finished um, in 2014, so six years ago already. And um, it deals with this particular typology that birthed in New York. So on the verge of the 20th century, uh, cities like New York will, uh, were full with apartments, uh, with apartment buildings, with no kitchens instead. Sorry. So these kitchenless apartments instead uh, were equipped with collective housekeeping services such as uh, centralized uh, vacuum systems, nurseries, shared maids, uh, collective kitchens, uh, and so on, and meals could be served either in each apartment or in a common dining room, usually. The disappearance of the kitchen from the physical space at the time, um, from the physical space of the house at the time, involved uh, a whole reconfiguration of the domestic uh, realm, uh, redefining the spaces of reproduction, labor, and its economic value and the role of women at home. So the, story, uh, the history of these uh, kitchenless apartments uh, dates back to the economic depression that followed the American Civil War. Uh, we are in 1860, 1865, when due to the lack of land and the, and, uh, and the lack of housing stock, most of American and North American cities needed to build apartments at uh, lower cost for middle class tenements. Working families with uh, median salaries as teachers, artists, vendors, and so on, could neither afford to buy it or rent the, and the existing uh, uh, townhouses, neither uh, accept to live in a tenement building, which uh, at the time, lack of facilities, bathrooms, and so on, and which were usually overcrowded, as the image that you see, as well as uh, it, they usually had a lack of healthiness, and therefore there was a lot of stigma against them. At the time, uh, in the US, uh, tenement was the only existing collective housing typology. So there was a huge need, an urgent need of a new uh, type of multi-dwelling building. 
So in that moment, uh, different housing typologies started to appear and, uh, and be tested. In fact, uh, for very different reasons that I will explain later on, many of them included features that um, can, be track, uh, and, uh, can be tracked to the domestic formulas and ideas um, that were proposed for certain ideological groups uh, in, uh, at the beginning of the um, 19th century including the so-called social utopias uh, visions um, that claim, among other things, the collectivization of uh, housekeeping, among other things as well, the kitchen. A movement led by uh, Henri de Saint-Simon, Charles Fourier, Etienne Cadet, uh, and Robert Owens, among others, that emerged as a response to precisely the first uh, industrial revolution and tried to reformulate, among other things, labor and social structures uh, that were established in the emerging uh, capitalist system. So we have to have in mind that in the mid um, that at the time in the, sta in the, in the States, uh, in, the, in, in the early 19th century, was a high for, for new and radical ideas. After decades, it is still relevant, even if it, this uh, project were um, passed a long time ago, it's uh, still relevant to go back also to books uh, such as uh, Seven America Utopias or the famous uh, book uh, titled Grand Domestic Revolution by Dolores Hayden to get the flavor of the complex of, uh, of, um, of that map of alternative ideologies of the 19th century in North America some of which were introduced uh, consciously or unconsciously in the core of this fast-growing capitalist uh, system. We have to have in mind that uh, precisely Robert Owen, an industrialist and social reformer, came to the United States in 1824, really to put his theories in practice after having successfully led uh, the community in the new Lanark together with the architect Stanman Whitewell, founded New Harmony, the one that we have in the picture, which um, they designed uh, a multifamily housing building with uh, community service and collective kitchens. Despite the fact that the building was uh, never built, it had a greater uh, social repercussion and around 15 similar communities Communities appear soon after in Indiana, New York, Ohio, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, etc. Ten years later, in the 40s, in 1840s, a socialist enthusiasts gained ground again, pulled above all by the spread of Fourierism uh, through the New York Tribune. A movement that reached a greater impact at Owen and uh, influenced the formation of around 30 uh, communities in northeastern territories of the United States. The research on this 19th century social utopias in the United States uh, has been uh, very extensive and very well known. In particular, the relation, and in particular, the relation with uh, the feminist uh, movements. And I'm recalling here again um, Haydn, but also Ungers, among others. However, some ideas uh, contained in these utopian projects have been sometimes presented disconnected of their operative, uh, operational nature as if there were mere radical speculation without direct consequences on capitalist society. Bringing them today allow us to visualize the existing sometimes buried links between these two apparent uh, unrelated walls, socialist and capitalist, and also help us uh, understand their intimate connection. Of course, the threat is uh, really fragile and never linear. Um, in, Links are often silent, unconscious, or simply have disappeared. In fact, uh, on many occasions, the principle that founded socialist projects were deactivated and de ideologized upon arriving um, in Manhattan. Uh, but um, it is already known the prevailing appropriation of ideas of the diverse origin, sometimes antagonistic and completely neutralized uh, that capital reuse in its favor. Almost um, actually going back to New York, 
Most of uh, these New York buildings with uh, shared domestic infrastructures were presented as a combination of the European apartment type with uh, the um, American hotel type, the, uh, denying totally its socialist influence and claiming its a lack of ideology or its neutrality as if uh, that could happen. When the kitchen nest typology is emerged, despite some critiques among the conservative uh, ideological sector for its excess of collectivism, it was successfully received uh, thanks to this, this apparent neutrality, especially among those who did not meet the strict profile um, of uh, the prevailing family standards at the time, consisting of a married couple with uh, several children. This department with collective uh, domestic services, probably called family hotels or apartment hotels, were considered as true uh, social progress and attractive alter alternative for reduced families, couples without children and singles. Paradoxically, by means of uh, eliminating the kitchen, these new apartment types were able to cover a wider social range. The promoters understood the house as a domestic machinery, of comfort composed by spaces and services on demand, which were able, um, both spaces um, and services, um, were able to redefine, to be redefined uh, permanently and uh, restructured in order to answer to a 19th century society in permanent change. The collective house with shared spaces was understood not as an apparatus to distribute health, wealth, as the social utopists uh, considered, but as a commodity and uh, their inhabitants uh, were understood not as equal bodies, but as consumers. In uh, 1971, uh, one year after the first apartment building was built in New York, it opened an apartment building with hotel services. It was an adaptation of an old family into a multifamily dwelling for 20 family and several bachelors. The building was called a high house, it's the one that you have in the picture, and it had five floors, uh, four devoted to family apartments, and five, uh, and the fifth floor devoted to bachelor apartments. In the basement, a laundry and a collective kitchens could uh, serve through a, a system of damp waiters to the different apartments. Meals could be served in a common dining room or in each apartment on demand. And all the apartments were actually um, connected thanks to pneumatic stoop and electric bells to this, uh, to this kitchen and uh, the reception of the building. Right after the, the Hyde House, uh, the Stevens and the Grosvenor were built. This last one um, it was uh, actually the first one to open its restaurant to the public, becoming a urban institution. In, in between, so we have a, with a human character in between domestic and the domestic and the public sphere, and expanding clearly its commercial capacity through the restaurant. It was through consumers that inhabitants could be easy merged with citizens, uh, blurring intimacies and publicities. After this one, after these first cases, hundreds of them were built in Manhattan. This typology between apartment and hotel was uh, extremely successful. They not only reduce significantly the cost of living, but also eliminate um, private housekeeping and consequently redefine, as I was mentioning before, the role of women at home. Life in these new apartments therefore constitute at some point an alternative that had more to do with increasing comfort than lowering cost especially for women or families that simply saw um, and, uh, and, and tried to find, to leave behind reproductive labor. Proof of this diversity and the diversity of the, of the dwellers is precisely the diverse uh, range of apartments we can find from uh, small ones uh, as the one that you have on the image to um, with uh, just two rooms in the bathroom to extremely um, large ones as this one, the after apartment house that contains uh, there are two apartments per floor many many um, diverse rooms but um, no kitchen
also it's interesting to recall that uh, we know um, through the press that uh, the success of these apartments uh, not only occur in New York. So the story that I'm explaining to here today could be expanded to other cities. And it's interesting to see that the arrangement of most of these first kitchenless apartments is very similar to the distribution, to the distribution of, a, of a pre-existing detached house. They usually uh, were distributed in two floors. It was an important convention for the middle class at that time to distinguish height in the public area from the most private uh, rooms, making it acceptable, for instance, to arrange bedrooms next to living rooms or dining rooms. Therefore, the first apartment buildings used to be distributed in different um, heights. So if you imagine that, um, in that sense, it's easy also to understand that the kitchen could be easily removed to another floor, out, even outside the house, or even shared, in order to avoid this uh, mix of uses. It is also interesting to see how usually in uh, these uh, first apartments, they use uh, simple tricks as placing uh, few stairs to divide these uh, uses per height. So with these uh, high tricks, uh, we understand how despite its collective or apparent um, public condition, this new typology emerged clearly as well to perpetuate class distinction, differentiating its middle class inhabitants from those from the low income uh, working class that usually they were in, in the so-called tenements. It was then therefore also an architectural apparatus for social class construction and representation based on sharing. During these uh, early years, um, examples were built around the Fifth Avenue, as you see on, uh, on the map. But uh, after opening the elevator, uh, the elevated uh, railroad along uh, Ninth Avenue in, 19, in 1879, most of them were built in the Upper West Side area, one that you really know. The Bearsford, when completed in 1889, was totally isolated. And uh, so from the last floor, uh, one could enjoy a spectacular views from Central Park. Suddenly, ac easy accessibility thanks to the elevator and uh, views that uh, were offered thanks to these high grade buildings, um, the top floors were um, of, uh, of desire. And it uh, started to be covered uh, in, uh, and change uh, into an attractive place uh, to provide public uh, rooms and gardens on the decks. And the first floor placed uh, here its dining place and its restaurant. And as the bare floor did, many other buildings started to open its roofs for social engagement. Spaces that were considered to be public and um, obviously public, and however, um, obviously with a lot of uh, racial and economic biases. In contrast to the Hyde House, these Upper West uh, Side buildings were much larger and most of uh, the apartments lack of kitchens and had uh, flexible, um, uh, and had uh, some sort of uh, flexibility. As you see in the images, they were extremely large, most of them. And as I was saying, the flexibility was um, valued. So they start um, composing the apartments uh, in order to have that. Um, and rooms could be added or, or subtracted uh, depending on the need. Uh, the San Remo Hotel, the one that you have an image, for instance, offer different size apartments. Uh, the key was um, this, um, these rooms uh, that were halfway in between two apartments and communicated both simultaneously, allowing to as large either one or the other, or connecting both. Then Sonia, also on the Upper West Side, still built and existing, um, also offered uh, some uh, flexible um, apartments. Um, and uh, there was a room that could uh, be extended and adjoining uh, to the different um, uh, apartments on demand. 
and uh, and you can tell that the potential for such buildings to offer um, apartments of different size was considered an asset in satisfying the demands of a wider demographic range. In the Ansonia, for instance, um, the offerings span from one bedroom apartment to with no bathrooms and no kitchen, so just one room, to 14 apartments um, bedroom with several rooms, uh, both uh, with or without the kitchen. So the kitchen has started also to be offered in these kitchenless uh, apartment buildings. And in the Ansonia, residents could eat either in uh, private rooms or in the common dining rooms as usual, but also the, you should have to consider that then these rooms uh, got larger. Its private, uh, its collective uh, dining room had a capacity of 1,300 people, and the building had all kind of fantastic uh, facilities for com for the comfort of residents, uh, as a pool in the basement, a large bathroom, a gym, uh, and a parking. And even at the rooftop, there was um, a, a farm uh, which had 500 uh, chickens, ducks, and goats. Uh, and each day, they could serve uh, fresh uh, milk and eggs to the residents. So suddenly, large numbers and extraordinary collective facilities and services were the hype of this emerging kitchenless type um, based on consumer, uh, domestic consumerism. And the expansion of these uh, commercial domestic infrastructures had its peak between uh, that day, 1901 and uh, 1929. Alongside the comfort uh, of uh, living a la carte um, with collective domestic uh, services, part of this success uh, was due to a new law, the enactment of uh, the tenement house law which regulated the conditions of residential buildings. The law left uh, uh, kitchenless apartment buildings out of its scope, and suddenly on a given site, after one, 901, an apartment auto could build higher and larger than other building types. So kitchen apartments, for instance. This loser uh, legal framework made um, hotels clearly advantages for developers who saw them at, as uh, really good investments. At the same time, due to the law and this economical situation, could, rents could be uh, therefore reduced, uh, making collective uh, domestic services affordable to a wider uh, social range expanding then for the consumer audience and uh, also then expanding the market. Uh, so it's important to recall how law uh, influenced this, uh, these living tendencies and housing markets. During those uh, first years, another proposal came, um, that came up uh, with, um, oh, sorry, this is really important to see this map of these expanding dots that uh, showed the impact of the law. It's also interesting to, to see how uh, during these first uh, decades, um, another, other proposals uh, came up of interest. Among them, uh, there was um, an other proposals to decrease housing loss, uh, uh, housing cost. Among them, there was uh, the multi-ownership uh, system, uh, commonly called, um, even until today, uh, cooperative housing. So the high price of rent in New York pushed uh, Philippe Hubert uh, to introduce a new ownership uh, system in which for the first time, future residents could be organized to build their own apartment building. This formula allowed to reduce cost and facilitate access to housing. Um, in addition um, to providing remnant apartments, so more than uh, initial inhabitants, that could be rented to help uh, amortize the, the initial investment. Hubert um, argued that, that uh, the French uh, apartments built for the raising uh, bourgeoisie during that time could not be considered as such for the bourgeoisie. Because since then, did, did, uh, they did not take advantage of uh, the collection of the idea of the collective, and, and in his opinion, they were simply single families, uh, single family houses, uh, placed one on top of the other. Unlike the French type at uh, Uber uh, Home Clubs, as uh, as he called uh, his his uh, initiative. 
uh, owners paid a monthly fee. So there was a little bit of fee to cover um, the cost of the building, which included um, not only the maintenance of the building itself, but also the maintenance of collective spaces and uh, services as a roof garden or a daily uh, supply of ice and coal, among others. Almost any type of collective need was covered in this uh, Uber um, home clubs, uh, something uh, that uh, wouldn't surprise us if, uh, if we know, if we knew that Uber was actually closely related to Fourier uh, theories, uh, the social utopies that I mentioned before. And uh, precisely, uh, he, was, he knew uh, really close um, the idea of cooperative housekeeping and, uh, and similar social proposals. In fact, his father, uh, Charles Antoine Colomb Jambert was the architect of uh, the famous Fourierist uh, Familistère uh, uh, placed in, in Conde uh, sur Berge. So, this uh, relation um, allowed Hubert uh, to know closely the social utopies, uh, utopias. In this sense, um, the figure of Hubert uh, is quite paradigmatic in terms of uh, to understand the multiple existing connections between theoretical political ideological positions close to utopian socialists and many of the housing buildings with collective services that emerged in New York at the time. Um, Uber was fully aware of uh, the advantages of living collectively and, uh, and among other things uh, in his uh, promotions he also included several um, examples that included collective kitchens and kitchenless apartments, as the one that you have in the image, um, um, the Sevilla, or also the really well-known Chelsea Hotel, which was built in 1883, and you might know it, um, and which, despite the more enormous success that it had, it closed, it had to close and, uh, in 1905, and it was turned into an hotel. Another important thing um, and crucial thing happened at the verge of, of the century. During the first half of the 20th century, the kitchen, especially the minimum kitchen, became a political tool able to link uh, macroeconomies with, uh, link with microeconomies. The consequences of this are still evident even nowadays, and um, suddenly uh, productive and reproductive labor became compatible both at the same time. The first minimum kit, uh, kitchen and compact kitchen has been uh, historically related to the Frankfurt kitchen designed by uh, Margaret Schutte-Lichotsky in 1926. Of course, uh, Schutte-Lichotsky ideas uh, to consider as a flag uh, ship of early modernism uh, within the domestic sphere were neither isolated nor created from scratch. By the time uh, Shutili Khotsky um, was quite acquainted with uh, theories coming from North America and specifically from the domestic engineer Christine Frederick, whose book, The New Housekeeping uh, Efficiency Society in Home Management, uh, published in 1913, was actually translated in German in 1922. So Frederick was interested in turning the kitchen uh, more efficient. Uh, for everyday use by applying um, motion study, uh, studies and other tailorists and for these um, methods. For her, the kitchen was uh, a home labor um, device where everything uh, well organized and compact in order um, to facilitate, uh, where everything could be well organized and compact in order to facilitate uh, daily cooking and other housekeeping works. Meanwhile, this is a story that you probably all know uh, of this paradigmatic uh, fitted kitchen and the Frankfurt kitchen is, uh, is extremely well known, um, as well as the influence with uh, and, and the relation with Christine Frederick theories about domestic engineering and labor saving devices um, and so on. Their impact on the design of the so-called modern kitchen is um, uh, the relation between uh, the North America and the so-called modern kitchen is well known. There's a side of this North America story um, that has usually been uh, missed and forgotten, and it's really important to to bring it here today. 
to recuperate that oversight key is actually really key to understand the actual condition of the kitchen as well as the relation, uh, the contemporary relation between reproductive and productive labor. Prior to Frederick studies, um, as apartment hotels, this kitchenless housing of New York became widespread, began to be widely used in the term kitchenette to designate a kitchen uh, typology that could occupy a reduced space. The kitchenette appeared initially way before the modern kitchen and the compact kitchen as a commodity for these uh, kitchenless residents, offering them the possibility of cooking uh, in the apartment in a timely manner. Before uh, its appearance, its, its commercial appearance, it was already usual that tenants uh, install makeshift uh, gadgets, as the one you see, for occasional cooking in the room. And uh, actually, thanks to the emerge of uh, electricity um, uh, du during this um, uh, ele um, industrial revolution, the stoves and other um, gadgets end up occupying any corner of the room uh, or even a closet to allow to uh, cook uh, time to, from time to time. Behind this improvised existence was, uh, in the first place, um, an economical reason. Um, it was um, being able uh, to prepare some of these meals uh, in the kitchenless apartment and skill uh, the collective meal, uh, allowed to save a lot of money at the end of the month. Um, but also there was a much simpler and uh, desire that was just to be able to cook once in a while. Thanks to the central kitchen, the annoyances of daily cooking uh, were erased and these uh, new kitchen devices allows us allow to understand cooking uh, for the first time as a pleasure rather than a duty. And it's something that is still really contemporary. A charm uh, that at the time resides precisely in the option, optional nature of, uh, of its use either for the comfort um, you know, uh, or the pleasure of doing it. A sense of cooking for leisure emerged precisely then when uh, reproductive labor was eliminated from the daily routine. And it stayed until nowadays, even if reproductive labor is still in our routine. These culinary devices became really soon commodities, being commercialized and objects of study and debate. Tiny ovens, toasters, kettles, and endless easy install, um, easily installing um, small appliances began to populate articles of opinion and advertisements, uh, which were devoted to, uh, you know, uh, say uh, the virtues and uh, which was superior to what, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And what is interesting is that progressively uh, the minimum kitchen uh, suddenly emerged also uh, as a complete product, as another product uh, by itself, offering all cooking devices, all those little devices in one. Um, so it was produced as a complex, uh, complex piece of furniture and usually commercialized, uh, as uh, you will see, uh, along other uh, pieces of flexible furniture allowing to convert any alcove in a kitchen, suddenly. The Beth uh, Murphy Co. and among other companies, as the White uh, Dorbeck Co., as you see, produce a series of units, either alone or combined, that made it possible to equip a minimum cuisine anywhere. A wide right, uh, range of um, purpose-built uh, devices uh, for reproductive labor were also commercialized as well uh, by these companies. Uh, really interesting. Uh, cubicles for uh, clean clothes uh, and dirty clothes to be sent to the laundry, uh, storage containers for raw and cooked food, um, or even a refrigerated cabinet that was popularized la uh, decades later by Le Corbusier at uh, L'Unité d'Habitation. Clearly, the compact kitchen, uh, looking to this, uh, it uh, did not arise uh, so much because of the need of optimize the organization of the kitchen, a typical labor saving and modern argument, but it raised to meet an existing need um, in this uh, kitchenless housing and uh, expand its commercial capacity. Also, 
it is, undeniable that uh, its origin, uh, the kitchenette was a, pr uh, a product, uh, furniture, and a saving, a space saving device. Progressively, its image became loaded with other meanings and connotations, and among them, uh, the already explained domestic efficiency. During the First World War, the concept of efficiency was applied everywhere but especially to housing. Since men were mobilized to the military, uh, women had to uh, fill their job vacancies, uh, highlighting the already existing incompatibility between uh, housekeeping and business hours, between productive and reproductive labor. Many articles then were published uh, about uh, Christian Frederick's domestic uh, scientific methods, um, that gave, among other theories, uh, that gave uh, women the opportunity to earn domestic engineering degree. So elevating the category of housework to a science. It appeared then uh, what they call um, uh, the already mentioned uh, the term domestic engineering. Supposedly, thanks to these uh, new methodologies, uh, women were able to execute a higher numbers of household scores with less effort quite a boom in a war time. Um, however, this interest uh, in mixing uh, science and education and engineering with house, household actually started way before domestic engineer emerged. During the 1870s, uh, in response to the to progressive industrialization of the American society, the so-called cooking schools began to appear. Since the beginning of this relation between education and domesticity, there was a dilemma regarding what uh, was sought uh, from the study and professionalization of domestic work. Among those supporters of the domestic uh, scientists, two groups uh, could be clearly discerned. On one hand, we, there was those who considered that professionalization of domestic work uh, was uh, necessary to facilitate some houseworks uh, while maintaining certain values of uh, women as a center of the house. On the other hand, uh, there were those uh, who believed that domestic professionalization and collectivization would uh, offer to women uh, access to academic studies plus work outside the home. The evolution of this compact kitchen, of this kitchenette, and the change, um, and the change of values of this minimal kitchen suffer um, so the, the change of values that this minimal kitchen suffered during these first decades uh, are totally related with these uh, two uh, um, narrations and ways of understanding the professionalization of domestic work uh, that emerged um, in the 19th century. After the first uh, kitchenettes appear uh, to give um, another service to those apartments without kitchens and, and that had collective uh, kitchens um, instead, the, they were, um, again, remember, um, important to say, they were a device more to, you know, to allow domestic versatility and, and uh, maybe consciously or unconsciously, um, they were in pro of the independence of women from home. The growing interest in labor saving devices meant that the kitchenette uh, lost progressively its original uh, cooperative character and gained autonomy. It's a small size which responded to be compact, responded initially the dimension, to the dimensions of a closet and it responded to the fact that it, there was another larger collective kitchen. Uh, suddenly, gradually became understood as an in instrument through which women uh, were, were able to carry out domestic tasks quickly, efficiently and autonomously. And so, Lastly, this engineering uh, autonomy uh, based on Fordings uh, falls into a contradiction really difficult to solve because Frederick and others tried to apply scientific methods which uh, for this and theories, which based on the division of works and the specialization, uh, not on a single woman, on many, and they, and they claim it to apply it on a single woman. Relying on the housewife as a unique housekeeper made the division of work impossible. And in this deep contradiction, the kitchenette became the perfect magical device uh, through which labor, this labor problem uh, could be apparently solved. Many reasons cause uh, that by the time the Frankfurt kitchen was designed, 
the kitchen end had lost all the implications and dependencies with a large infrastructure and it was totally forgotten. The debate initiated during this 80, during the 80s, 70s uh, in the schools uh, about reproductive labor um, and productive labor was solved thanks to this device. And many and a type of uh, a commercial living a la carte uh, were um, both uh, labors um, um, were wage and not necessarily feminine uh, started its decay as we will see. But let me go backwards to specifically New York and talk and start talking its peak and decay of the type. The First World War not only had an impact on the social role of women, um, with the start of the conflict in 1914, uh, the, reconstru the construction sector totally stopped, um, and the housing affecting uh, the housing stock. And, stock. and however, uh, the population of the city kept uh, raising. Recognizing this emergency situation in 1920, of uh, the state of New York allowed municipalities uh, to waive taxes uh, during 10 years uh, for residential building construction. The effect was immediate and led to a construction boom of housing. This period uh, of uh, prosperity and growth uh, lasted until the famous uh, depression um, that started happening in 1929. During these years, uh, numerous, uh, again, a lot of kitchenless apartment buildings were built that typically um, diverse from the processors, uh, basically uh, due to the um, application of the 1916 zoning law, which uh, limited and defined the volumetric growth of the city. So the characteristic figurat uh, uh, profile of the law that depended on the shape, uh, which the shape depended on the area that the building was placed in. Um, it was interesting to see how this dependency affect to the form because actually the greater were the lots, uh, the greater the proportion of the building area surface uh, could be. Therefore, investors tended to value larger plots and larger buildings. The apartments hotels were not an exception to the rule, and they began to combine different uses within uh, the so-called uh, envelope uh, to give uh, substance to such large infrastructures. The use of apartment hotels uh, was uh, first combined uh, with other uses, uh, increasing uh, further the collective and urban character. For, uh, for instance, the one that you have in the image combine an art center with uh, various apartments and collective domestic services. The law also allowed uh, that the 25% of the plot area could grow without limit. So as far as technical skills or uh, financial constraints allowed. Obviously, the larger the plot, uh, the greater was also this 25%. This encouraged many uh, permanent hotels not only to occupy large lots, but also to clock and fulfill this 25%, formalizing high residential towers. Precisely that's when it appeared a new type of apartment that allowed to live literally in high. The progression of high of residential buildings in those years was uh, extreme. If in 1924, the tallest building in Manhattan had eight, 28 floors, in 1928, there was already a project uh, to build a residential tower of 58, so just 30 floors more in uh, four years. So kind of what is happening now again. And thanks to the setbacks of this envelope, um, also appear potential areas that could be used as private terraces. The homes, for instance, of the Waldorf Towers were announced, kitchenless by the way, were announced in turn, uh, showing scenes of this uh, dream of uh, hanging uh, gardens as one of the attractions of living heaven, in heaven. Due to this new shape, um, the fantastic uh, flat rooftops that used to occupy the Upper West Side and offer popular social spaces during the 19th century progressively disappear in favor of private uh, terraces. The private realm took over the collective one and a new system of value based on uh, privatization of height and the air emerged. The Ritz Tower, for instance, was exemplary in this, uh, in this aspect. Above the ground, there was a total of 400 rooms and divided in, uh, from apartments from one room to 18 rooms. 
and the tallest uh, the better and the tallest uh, the biggest uh, so so the privilege of uh, raising these towers invited to include larger apartments that could uh, rent it at higher prices in higher floors while lower apartments were reserved to lower uh, and adjusted incomes um, so somehow the famous New York envelope and its endless 25% was the ultimate capital tool at the beginning of the 20th century to reshape class and economic value, eliminated most of collective spaces in New York City in favor of wealth accumulation. In parallel uh, to the change posed by this domestic ideal that was taking over the city, New York hotel industry also started to begin um, to take a dim view of the successful of this fast growing uh, typology, this kitchenless typology. And in late 1926, decided to undertake a series of lawsuits against its competitors. According to the lobby, apartments hotels could not be uh, considered true hotels since they mostly had. Um, permanent residents, and they should uh, be um, considered equal to apartment buildings and regulated by their much more restrictive uh, housing law. So suddenly newspapers started to publish frequent um, articles informing and warning about the penalties and illegal proceedings taken against the owners and inhabitants as well of such buildings. Along uh, with this bias uh, and political agenda, um, uh, these continuous legal proceedings and force uh, with strong penalties um, disseminated in printed media were effect an effective, a really good effective mechanism to devalue the image of uh, these kitchenless homes. This process of accusation and counter accusations, uh, later known as uh, the famous bootleg hotel, came to a conclusion in the spring of 1929 with the approval of a new housing law uh, called multiple dwelling um, law that explicitly included apartment hotels prescribing the same limitations of height, occupation and border and volume that were mandatory for the rest uh, for the rest of housing types. So suddenly kitchen apartments with collective devices, um, uh, services, sorry, uh, lost uh, some of the privileges and consequently their economic viability. So it was the start, the starting of the decay, clearly. This new legal policy uh, defined under the pressure of the hotel lobby and compounded by the re-evaluation and mediation, and as I explained about the new housekeeping and the role of women um, uh, through this, uh, the race of domestic engineering, uh, produced the decline of uh, this uh, a popular models vivendi that uh, had worked um, quite cohesively until 1929. We have also to have in mind that this uh, progressive crisis uh, also um, succeed due to the emerge of the first uh, red scar, scare which followed the Bolshevik uh, Russian Revolution in 1917 and the promotion of fear of a potential rise of communists in the United States invited to be afraid of any type of collectivity. Suddenly, sharing was uh, related to a particular ideology, which uh, it was not that clear until then, and it was seen as a mechanism of uh, governmental control against um, freedom. In the mid of the 30s, after the economic crisis of 1929, uh, most of these apartment, uh, kitchenless apartment, uh, couldn't manage to survive, and the heyday of a typology started to be um, uh, to, to disappear and erase the space. And, and it's a pity that you know we had this typology that was able to erase actually the spaces of reproduction labor from the domestic sphere, and uh, it started to be over. What I think is interesting uh, to understand today is that after um, one century later, the bootleg uh, hotel uh, polemic kind of recalls uh, some conflicts around online platforms as Airbnb and similar ones. There are shifting, uh, as it, it happened uh, at the time, home values and domestic uh, economies. Nowadays, the house is not longer um, just an exchange in a space for our belongings and a space for care, 
but a transient and productive uh, and network space that answered to our needs through the use of apps and similar commodities. Not long ago, a family would uh, still gather around the TV, and nowadays, in the boost of this uh, fourth industrial revolution, run by this uh, the new uh, the digital technologies and internet, a new social engaging with um, new social uh, um, character is engaged with the uh, atomization of devices and the increase uh, of on demand uh, of and demand of uh, services online and spaces. Due to this online reality in our cities, uses and functions merge more and more, both in the urban and the domestic sphere. Houses and workplaces become increasingly closer one to another. The number of people working from home is increasingly, um, alongside the number, number of, of citizens uh, who use their homes as productive uh, spaces. Reproduction and production are getting closer once again. Currently, um, um, sorry, the spaces, I mean. Currently, digital platforms allow um, serve, um, people not only to work from home, but also to market their houses and domestic services online with ease, turning the house once more in a productive uh, uh, space for, product, in a space for productive labor that extends beyond housework. And we all know that from people renting rooms online to uh, selling um, domestic uh, cooked food as well online, et cetera, et cetera. Even leisure, leisure uh, has, uh, and leisure and labor have uh, been merged uh, in a really uh, dangerous manner in this 24 7 realm. Again, as uh, Paul B. Preciado uh, recalls us in the article that I mentioned before, that I totally recommend to read. Today, we are moving from a writing society to a civil society, from an organic society to a digital society, from an industrial economy to an immaterial economy, from a form of disciplinary and architectural control to forms of micro prosthetic and media cybernetic control. The limits of our houses and are not just physical, any longer are cybernetic. Under this new scenario, Productive and reproductive labor spaces and their relation with bodies and capital once again is being reshaped and redefined under new systems of control. The fast growing online practices has found an unregulated uh, situation which is prolific for changes um, in this uh, patriarchal, colonial, and extra, uh, extra uh, uh, regime. Unfortunately, at the same time, um, it's also easy for the fast uh, capitalist appropriation. Contemporary and regulated domestic practices from renting rooms uh, and to cooking uh, home food as I'm um, selling online, I was referring, are being permanently discussed and debated as they are defining business, uh, traditional business models. It's true that as it turns out, the expansion of these platforms uh, often goes against rights of of, uh, of workforces. Airbnb, Uber, and similar companies are just the peak of an iceberg of this type of unfair companies. The corporate sharing economy took advantage of the situation that uh, developed after the 2008 crisis, um, and it took it as an opportunity to dismantle labor conditions, not by means to rethink the economic system um, and to make it fairer, by to achieve uh, new levels of exploitation and concentration of wealth using digital nets. In this process, of, uh, the idea of the collective, the commons, um, and the concentration of uh, wealth uh, using online uh, networks um, uh, is uh, really fast uh, neutralized and has lost all this meaning. Uh, so, by engulfing and regulated online practices, the capital is progressively also disabling the possibility of um, online mechanism uh, of uh, resistance. So, however, I think that despite the neutralization of words and despite uh, this uh, new mechanism of, um, of uh, discretion, the actual moment of mutation can allow us once again uh, to envision new social and economic structures beyond the binary sexual and colonial model, moving from an heteropatriarchal model uh, um, 
to a non-hierarchical forms of um, space and reproduction of life. The new industrial revolution uh, brings once again the opportunity to of, uh, redefinition of uh, the established power. 